Welcome to the Antioch Podcast, designed to nurture knowledge, cultivate creativity, heal the heart, and strengthen for service. Thanks for listening, and welcome home. Good morning, church. As the team was finishing up, I was reminded of a song um, that was very popular when I first came to believe. Um, There's maybe three people in here who'll know it, but it's the, your name is like honey on my lips. Do you guys remember that one? No, no one knows it? Oh my gosh. Oh. So I remember when I first came to believe, and um, for those of you who don't know the story, I grew up Jewish and in the process of trying to disprove Christianity, ended up becoming a believer. Um, But I remember like growing up, the name Jesus was like a four-lettered word to me. Um, Because growing up Jewish, there's very much that us versus them mentality. And um, I always saw all the oppression, all the pain that my family had gone through and and, um, all all the kids who would pick on me in school for being Jewish and, and all that stuff. Always from my perspective, it was the them which equated to the Christians. And so the name of Jesus was was not honey on my lips. It was very difficult when I first came to believe. Um, I couldn't even really say it. I had to to use his Hebrew name, Yeshua. I would always refer to him as Yeshua. Um, And I, I just remember there was this moment where God brought this healing balm. This has nothing to do with the message. I'm just reminiscing really quickly. Um, this healing balm that came and, um, Help me to fall in love with the name of Jesus. Even though Yeshua is more accurate, there's something about that name and any expression of it, we need to learn to be okay with it and not fight it. And and, and there's just this moment where my heart melted and, and truly his name became like honey on my lips. Oh, his spirit like water to my soul. And his word is a lamp unto my feet. Oh, man, he's so good. Okay, anyway, sorry, enough reminiscing. Um, we're going to jump in today. You guys, today we're moving into the, um, the second part of our focus for this year. Um, this year, our, our main focus, our word of the year is hope. So all year long, we're going to be looking at what does hope mean? How do we live this out? Specifically, there were three things from the book of Joel, which we went through already, um, that were highlighted. And these are gonna be kind of the focus of what we're looking at. So the first is finding hope. And we've, we've kind of gone through that. We'll still come back to that and return to it from time to time. Uh, this idea of finding hope, how do we find hope? What does that look like? We look practically, how do we do that? Uh, the second is living hope or living from this place of hope. How do we do that? How do, what, what's different in our lives if we live from this place of hope? And the third is bringing hope. How are we going to bring hope into a world that is desperate for it? Um, they, they need it so much more than they realize. They need it so much more than we realize. We need it so much more than we realize. It's so incredibly important. Um, so let me just start with reminding you of the definition we're working with for hope this year, because we're going to come back to it over and over again. Um, hoping isn't wishing. Uh, a lot of times that's how we use that word, like, oh, I really hope I get a good score on that test. That, that's just wishing, and there's no foundation to, behind it. But if you studied for the test and you prepared for the test and you did practice tests and you're getting 100% on all of those, and any time you go through it, it's like every practice test you've done is really easy, then instead of hoping you get a good score on your test, you can have a hope that you will get a good score. So hope, here's our definition. Hope is a joyous, confident expectation of the good that is not yet seen. Let me just say it one more time because it's really important. Joy, uh, sorry, hope is the joyous, confident expectation of the good that is not yet seen. 
That's what it means to have a hope. Hope is more of a noun than a verb. Uh, At least I think it's helpful to think of it in this way. You have a hope. You have a joyous, confident expectation that all will be well and all will be well and all manners of things shall be well. You have a hope, not you're really hoping it works out. You have a hope. It's a noun. It's, it's, it's static. It's there. It's not going anywhere. It's an anchor for the soul. It stays still. It doesn't move all over the place, depending upon your feelings or the circumstances. It's, it's a noun and it's there. It's just static and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. And that's what we're diving into. Um, in the process of doing that, we're going to go through, we already went through the book of Joel. Now we're going to go through the book of Luke. Um, So I do want to offer, if there's anyone who has not gotten one of the journals yet, in the journal, we have the book of Luke. The entire book of Luke is in there with space for you to take notes right next to it. So uh, we're going to begin going through it. Um, We did ask if if you can help donate to it. These ended up costing us about $15 each. We're asking for a donation of $5, but if you can't do $5, whatever, just take the book. We already bought them. The money's already spent. Um, So if there's anyone in here who would like a copy, who doesn't have a copy and would like a copy, I think we have, do you have some back there? Cool. Just raise your hand and Sailor will bring you one if you need one of these. And we want you to have them. So um, please, 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 if, if this is going to help you or bless you, throw your hands in the air and wave them like you just don't care. Because if you like Jesus the way I do, everybody say, oh, yeah. Thank you. Wow. That, was, that went better than I thought it would. You guys really jumped in. I didn't even commit to it. I just kind of threw it out there. Okay. Well, that being said, we are in the book of Luke. So we're now starting kind of our second big idea, which this focus is now on how do we live from hope? A living hope. What does that look like? How do we walk this out? Now, I need to tell you before I even get started with the book of Luke, I'm not going to be teaching through it how I would traditionally teach through a book of the Bible. Um, We're doing it largely with a filter put on, um, and that filter is hope. So reading the book of Luke through the filter of hope, what do we see? It's just a different way of going through scripture. And, uh, you know, you should definitely read Luke just for what it is and straight on. And, and we're going to do that too. But, but really, I'm going to be emphasizing where you see hope and living hope and how to walk this out. Um, we're, we're trying to uh, get all the gold out of this book that we can as it pertains to this idea of hope this year. So um, I, 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 I have an expectation, I should say, Um, I have a hope um, that you will be spending the week also reading through the the book of Luke um, and and letting the Holy Spirit show you all kinds of different things in there. Um, Because there's no way in the time we have in trying to do a chapter a week, and I I put this thing on myself. The Word of God is so important that I don't want to just you know, cherry pick a few verses here and there. So when we go through a book of the Bible, we read all of the words, um, which sometimes is a lot of words, but, um, but I think it's important and we should be able to do that together as family in the church and, and reading through it together. So, um, in order for me to be able to do that, I can't teach as much stuff as I would like, which is probably better for you. So we'll just let the, the Bible teach itself. But just so you know, we're going through it with this perspective, with this filter on of hope. What is God showing us about hope? What can we learn about hope as we process through this? Um, so a couple of background pieces of information about Luke. Um, Luke, I, most of you know, is a physician an incredible writer. Um, It's really interesting. He modifies his style of writing in the book of Luke depending on the story he's telling. So when he's telling a story, for example, of, um, of, of Paul, teaching to Jewish people. He writes it in a very Semitic form. It's, it's, it's standard Jewish 
prose and poetry and writing is the style he uses. But then when Paul is teaching to the Greeks, he all of a sudden adopts a Greek style of storytelling and writing as he's telling the story of Paul's interaction with the Greek. It's really fascinating if you understand what's going on and how brilliant he is as a writer as he's doing it. He's adopting all these different genres because it fits the story he's telling. Not to change the story, but like, hey, here's a story that takes place in, it's kind of like um, if you were going to tell a story and in the middle of you telling the story, you meet someone with a Southern accent and then all of a sudden you change all of the story as you're telling the story, you tell it in a Southern accent, that kind of thing. So he's trying to help you to really dive in and, and embrace it and feel like you were there which is just fascinating. Don't you think that's interesting? I think that's interesting. Uh, He was a companion to Paul, very close companion to Paul. Um, Tradition holds that he came from Antioch. So, woo-hoo, winning again. Um, Probably the biggest thing that we get from Luke that is very unique to him is a theology of glory. In Luke, he talks over and over and focuses so much on glory. And the, and the greatness of God and the goodness of God and the, the glory of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You get so much of this, what's called the theology of glory from Luke that you don't get nearly as much. In our, you get it in other places, just not nearly as much. He's emphasizing the glory over and over again and the presence and the activity of the Holy Spirit. You're going to see that a lot as we go through this. But enough intro, let's jump in. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke 1. If you have your journals, I don't know what page it's on. What page is it on? 104. 104. Wow, you guys are really fast. That was impressive. The book of Luke. All right, here we go. You guys ready? Uh, Actually, you know what? Pause. I'm going to pray. Lord, would you give me the words to speak today? Help me to not say anything that isn't of you and help me to say everything that you're saying. I don't want to miss out on anything. Lord, we entrust it all to you and I ask, Lord, that you would prepare all of our hearts to meet you today, to encounter you today, to be transformed by your presence Lord, we ask that you would sow a good seed in our heart today, that we would be completely changed as a result of it. And we ask for fast fruit. In your name we pray, amen. All right, here we go. Luke 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Okay, that's, that's enough for us to start. Here's our introduction. First, he's writing to Theophilus. The, the name Theophilus, it's, we're confident that this is actually a person. This isn't just a general category, but he's writing to a person who's probably um, his sponsor, so to speak. He's the one who helped pay for Luke to be able to write these different things. You know, papyrus was expensive, having the time to do stuff like that. So, so as an artist, kind of, he had this person who helped support him so he could do his work. He could do what needed to be done. Um, but the name Theophilus is the combination of two words, theos, which is the a word for God, and phileo, which is like Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. So Theophilus is a friend of God. And it's, it's, it's more than just like, you know, Facebook friend. It's like real friend of God. There's, there's this friendship, love with God. There's, there's this connection that Theophilus has and is, is exploring with God. And it's possible that he was a disciple, that he was a believer, you know, not one of the 12, but one of the the ones that came from them. But I think more likely, especially given everything that's written in here for him, I think it's more reasonable to see him as someone who's open to the truth 
and has heard some of it, but hasn't quite made that decision to give his everything yet to following Jesus. Now, I might be wrong in this. There are reasons I think this is the case. I think it's important, but um, I think just in general, this is a category of people in the church that we tend to ignore. Um, we tend to kind of like how I did with my Jewish perspective, there's us and there's them. We kind of have that same thing that still happens with us. Um, and, and I think that's wrong. I think even in scripture, you see, there's this very clear, like three categories. There's like the world, the people have want nothing to do with God who are just kind of out there. There's the crowd that it just, you know, they're not really in, but then there's the ones who like are drawing near, but aren't quite in yet. They're, they're trying to learn. There's something there. They, they can feel something drawing them, but they're not quite. I think like the rich young ruler, for example. They, they feel there's something about this Jesus guy, and I want to know more, and I want to find out some more information, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, I, I, I think that's kind of where Theophilus would have been. It doesn't really matter, um, but I, I just want to say this. Um, Maybe you're here this morning, and because you've always thought there were only the two categories, those who believed and those who didn't, um, I don't know how to say this. My fear is that there might be some in here who think that they're in but aren't really in. You're just a friend of God, and you haven't quite gone all the way yet to give your everything to him. And I, I just want to say this, and not this isn't in, in a judgmental way at all. I'm just saying there's so much more when you can get to the place where you finally give your everything to him. When you can, as, as Paul talks about, dying to self. When you can just let go of, of, of holding back on anything and just give him your everything. Um, that, that, there's, there's just something there. And, and I want to tell you, if you're here and maybe you're not quite there yet, it's okay. Take some time. Get to know him. Spend some time with him. Spend some time with his family. But to be clear, the goal should be someday you, 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 you commit. Um, I... I <laughs> It's not enough just to date Jesus or to be in an exclusive relationship with him. I want you to to really know him. And in the Bible, whenever they talk about someone knowing someone else, that's a, a, a picture of deep intimacy from which babies are born, if you catch my drift. And that's inappropriate outside of the bounds of marriage. So I just want you to know that if, if you're here and you're looking and you're searching and you feel like I'm, you know, I like Jesus, I'm a friend of God, and, and, and that's wonderful. But I want you to know there's so much more available. And I think that's why Luke is writing this. Um, so he says, um, I, I'm writing this to you that you would have certainty so that you could have a joyous, confident expectation. Luke is writing this so that Theophilus, I believe, can truly have hope, have this real hope in Christ Jesus. Um, he wants him to be able to move from knowing about Jesus to knowing Jesus. Uh, that's my heart too. I want you to move from knowing about Jesus to knowing him. Our certainty, our hope isn't found in us knowing about Jesus. You can know about Jesus and not have hope. Our certainty, our hope is found in knowing him. Theology is no substitute for communion with God. Now, that doesn't mean theology isn't important. I'm just saying it's not a substitute for it. Your theology should lead you to knowing him, should lead you to communion, should lead you to connection. More and more and more. Courtship still precedes engagement. And you first have to get to know one another. And that's why he's writing this. And that's why I'm sharing this. I want you to get to know Jesus better. 
I want to get to know Jesus better. There's so much more of him to get to know. Because that has to take place before we can be one. And it's in getting to know him that we fall in love with him. I don't want these to be cheap words. I want you to know how this works. It's in the getting to know him, the spending time with him, the learning to hear his voice, the learning to walk in his ways. It's in the getting to know him that we fall in love with him and we truly know him. So let's join Luke as he helps us in this process of getting to know Jesus. Not just know about him, but moving beyond that to, okay, let's get to know him a little bit better. So we start, this first portion is about a hopeless pregnancy. Verse five. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Let's pause there. Both Zechariah and Elizabeth are parts of the priestly line. They're both Kohanim. They're both Levites of that relationship, of that lineage. And it, look at the way it describes them. They're both righteous in the sight of God and observe the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. They're blamelessly obedient. That is a bold statement about two people who are not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. However, both of them lived a life of feeling cursed and hopeless because they had no children. Now, I, this is hard to sell to this generation because we, we don't get it. Like, well, maybe they just wanted to be dinks and they didn't really, dual income, no kids, in case you're not following that. They just, they just wanted to be dinks and they just wanted to be able to travel and didn't want to be weighed down. But you understand, like for someone to not be able to have children then was a big deal. It was a huge source of shame, and it was usually seen as judgment. What have you done? Think Job's friends. Well, you must have done something. Confess your sin. And both of them are Levites. Both of them are righteous and, and perfectly obedient. And yet they're living a life, honestly, of sorrow and shame. Everyone around them would have judged them because they couldn't have children. And to some degree, they lived a life of despair. And they were both very old. So it was too late to look for hope. Let's continue, verse eight. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Okay, just pause really quickly. You have to understand what's happening here. Um, the, so the incense had to be burned in the morning and in the evening. Um, and so there was constantly incense in the temple. Um, To be able to be chosen by lot to go in, this is a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Most of the Levites would never have a chance to do this in their entire lives. So the fact that he was chosen by lot was a very big deal. It was like winning the lottery. Um, So the other thing is for, for him and from his perspective, this isn't just chance. Like, oh, I got lucky. There's, there's no idea of lucky for them. They, they chose by lot because they believed that God would ordain the lot that would be pulled. This is what God wanted and who God wanted in there. So when Zechariah went into the temple to offer this sacrifice, to bring the incense, he's, he knew this isn't coincidence. 
God has blessed me today with the incredible opportunity to come and bring an offering of incense into his temple. And you guys, it like, you, you got to try to imagine. It, it's like he won the lottery. He's like, I got the, I've got the golden ticket. I'm like, he's so excited. Like, I can't believe I get to do this. Church, where is our expectation and our excitement? that we get to come and offer incense and worship and praise and prayer before our God. You are so blessed among people that you have the opportunity to come and worship him, that you have the opportunity to come and, and sing his praise. That First, that we could gather together as the church is an incredible blessing, and a blessing that many in this world do not have that we can openly come and worship our God. That we could pray before our meals at a restaurant. Do you know what a blessing that is? How, how incredibly blessed you are. And not only that, but then you, you get to do this in your own homes, in your prayer closet. It's just, it's just a lot. David said, I was glad when they said, I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Listen to this psalm. I love this psalm. Psalm 141, 2. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. This is what he was excited to do to bring his prayers like incense, to lift up his hands in worship like the evening sacrifice, to come before the king, to come before the king in his house. One thing I seek, one thing I ask, that this will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of, of the Lord in this temple. You know, this, is, this is to offer our lives to our king should be our greatest delight. We should be so excited about the opportunity to come to church, to gather with other believers and lift his name on high. We don't come to church primarily to get something from God. We don't get excited because, oh, you know, I really enjoy that song they did today. Or I really enjoyed the message. I, I feel like I was challenged and I learned something. It, it, our delight, our great delight is that we could come and we could just pour out our prayers and worship as incense before our king. What a treasure that is. That we have the opportunity as a kingdom of priests to come and make that sacrifice. Um, I think when Zechariah came in, he knew God ordained for me to be in here today. And he knew this was exciting. He had an expectation that he was meeting with God. And I hope we all have that expectation when we come through those doors. Actually, I hope we all have that expectation when we walk out those doors too. But he didn't expect what was coming next. Verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. I just want you to notice that. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He'll be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented, other fermented drink. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay, let's pause there. Wow. Unexpected. 
definitely did not have any expectation of this being the conversation that's about to happen as he walks in. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And not just a son, a spirit-filled from the womb son who's going to walk in the spirit and power of Elijah. Guys, that's a big deal for a Jew. That's massive. Like Elijah, like Elijah's like the guy. It's like, wow, like Elijah? Yeah, like Elijah. And he's going to prepare people for the Lord. The angel came to proclaim hope, not just for Zechariah and for Elizabeth, but for all of Israel. And he says to him, your prayer has been heard. And I I just want to hang on this for a little bit. How long, given the, the difficulty of being barren and not having a child and the shame that's attached to it and the pain that's attached to it and the feeling of judgment that's there, how long as a priest, as a godly and righteous man with a righteous wife, both of the line of Aaron, how long do you think they've been praying for a child? How many times have they cried out at the altar of God? made sacrifices, made offerings, fasted, did everything they could, prayed fervently for this. How long did they pray for? How many prayers were poured out? And here's the bigger question, I think. He's a very old man now. How long has it been since they stopped praying? Your prayer has been heard. And maybe as this incredibly righteous man and this incredible guy, remembering stories in the Old Testament of of Abraham and Sarai and then becomes Sarah, maybe he remembered those stories and he held on to the hope, but I think it probably had been a long time since he had prayed since he was able to really believe that they would have a son, have a child of any type. Because that's a, that's a pain that's hard to hold on to. That's a hope that, that is, is thorny to grip. I think it was a long time since they believed that a child could be born. And the prayers that the angel is referring to were prayers from a long time ago. The Lord has heard your prayer. Let's look at the next verse. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. First off, brilliant husband move right there. (laughs) Like he doesn't say his wife is old at all. He like, he's figured this out. I'm an old man. My wife is... well advanced in year. <laughs> like he's, just, he's just smart. He doesn't uh, call her old at all. But I, I think what he's asking here is how, how can I hope? We're too old. This, that season has come and gone. It's too painful to hope again. Yes, this is so real and and literally thank the Lord that most of you probably have never experienced anything like this. But there are some things that to hold on to that hope is just far too painful. I hoped for so many years and nothing happened. I can't do it again. It's too painful. It's too hard. It's too heavy of a burden to carry. Sometimes it's just so much easier to give in to despair than to hold on to hope. And that's just real. Verse 19. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent. 
and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Okay. Um, seems unfair a little bit because it's like, I mean, he's very old. His wife is very old. This is kind of reasonable. Like, how can this happen? What is going on? Why make him mute? Anyone ever think that's like a weird punishment? Like, why is he? I don't think he was punishing him at all. I think he knew. I think he absolutely knew that Zechariah would talk himself out of the hope. He would leave that room and he would go and he, and just imagine that like we know in just a few verses, everyone's waiting for him to come out. Can you imagine him coming out to all these other Levites and be like, yeah, an angel told me that I'm going to have a baby. They, okay, Zechariah, mm, sitting a little too close to that incense and uh, <laughs> they mix something in there. I think he knew if he started talking about this, he would have all the people that would convince him that you must be mistaken. You know, you know, just don't worry about that. Just love God anyway. You don't, 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 it doesn't matter what happens. And they would convince him and talk him out of this hope. And remember, at this moment, God had not spoken to the prophets or the Levites in hundreds of years. And you think he's going to come out and the Levites are going to be like, oh, yeah, sure. This random dude, uh, Levite, that goes in of the the over 10,000 of us, he goes in just to offer the incense and he comes out and God waits for hundreds of years to finally announce you're going to have a child in your old age. They would totally have convinced him this wasn't true. Let me say something. Our doubts, and and listen, there's a place for doubt and you can't deny the doubts. You have to deal with your doubts. You have to walk through them. Just don't put more faith in your doubts than in your faith. Um, But our doubts can stall or prevent God's plan for our lives. This is one of the reasons that hope is so important. You'll see a difference with Mary. When Mary was told these things, she didn't have the, if I'm right in this, she she didn't have the temptation to go and talk to everyone about it. When Mary heard, heard these things that were miraculous and crazy and like, oh my gosh, and like, you have to hold on to the hope because you can't see it yet. You're not gonna see it for a long time. What did Mary do with that stuff? She hid it in her heart. She stored all these things up in her heart. I think Zechariah didn't do that. That wasn't his, and I might be wrong on this. I'm just telling you how I'm reading it and what I felt like God was showing me. We need to learn from this, and this is just a practical side note. Some of us need to keep quiet. Let our words be few. Don't talk about everything that God is doing in your life or everything that he's showing you in your life. Especially not with everybody. There are some people in your life that are going to damage your hope and damage your faith and damage your trust. And you have to be cautious with who you share your stuff with. So just bear that in mind. I mean, there's a place for sharing things and you want to be able to share things, but don't just go out sharing it, casting your pearls before swine. Sometimes when you overshare, it leaves you empty. There's a phrase that Corey and I would use every once in a while when we're preparing messages, stuff like that. And um, she would ask, do you want to share with, with me what God's been showing you? I said, no, no, I need to keep the steam in. So it's this idea of like when you take a shower, really hot shower, and like you know how it, like the steam builds up in the shower, you know what I'm talking about? And then you open the door and all the steam goes out. You close it and then it's cold in the shower again. Maybe we just have an old house, so it does that. Maybe you don't have that. Um, so sometimes you need to keep the steam in. Like I can't, I can't let it out because I, I, God's still doing something with me in this. I need that pressure cooker to get me going. 
I need to, I need to, don't keep opening the oven when you're cooking something or it's never going to cook. God's still cooking something inside of me. And if I keep sharing it, I keep opening the oven door, it's never going to cook. Okay, let me keep going. Verse 21. Are we doing okay? Cool. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me. I think she's talking about the pregnancy, not the fact that her husband is now mute, but it's just... The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Guys, it's real. She says it right there. They've been carrying so much disgrace, so much pain, and hope has returned to their home, and everything changed. We keep going. Now we're going to look at a second hopeless pregnancy. This one even more miraculous than the first. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, Ave. Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Gabriel comes and he proclaims hope. The hope that all of Israel had been waiting for. That the Messiah is going to be born. That the Christ would come and would be born of this virgin. And there's so much we could talk about here, but this is the one verse that really hit me as I was processing through this. For no word of God, no, excuse me, for no word from God will ever fail. This is the foundation of our hope, the faithfulness of God. Um, really quickly, I want us to look at Hebrews 6. We're just going to read this verse, Hebrews 6, verses 16 through 18. I'll read it to you in just a moment. But this is a good one for you to see and maybe highlight or underline in your Bibles or write it down. Hebrews 6, verses 16 through 18 say this. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the ears of what, his prom- of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. Okay. It's kind of confusing. It's a lot of words. Just briefly what it's saying. So that we can have hope. 
so that we can have a joyous, confident expectation of the good that God has promised to us that is not yet seen. God not only tells us it, and his, his, his word is true, he cannot lie. Not only does he tell us it, but then he makes an oath in his name on top of it just to make sure you can be confident. It's kind of like when we do like, I swear on my mother's grave, like your mom's not even dead yet, but still. I like, you, know, you say stuff like that and it's try to like put more emphasis behind what you're saying. Like, no, you can really trust me because I'm, I'm, I'm making an oath according to this other thing. Or when we uh, swear in presidents, they have to put their hand on the Bible and they have to take an oath. Um, you know, doctors still do the Hippocratic oath. And, and, you, and you have all these different oaths that we take that are supposed to be more meaningful because you're solidifying it with an oath. God doesn't need to take an oath. His word, what he says will come to pass. What he says he will do. But on top of that, he's like, I'm even going to make an oath. And I can't put my oath on anything greater than my name. So I'm going to make an oath in my name and my word is true. You can be confident that this is going to happen. Our part is simply as Mary responded, may your word to me be fulfilled. May your word to me be fulfilled. I receive. There's another way to say it. You know, another way to say is I receive it. Amen. Amen. Let it be so. Now let's continue. Now we're looking at the response of these two women with two miraculous, seemingly hopeless opportunity for pregnancy, both now pregnant. And here's how they respond, filled with the Holy Spirit and with hope. Verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Or in other words, blessed is she who has hope. Elizabeth's restored hope, because I mean, she's pregnant now. She, she, she doesn't need to have the hope anymore. She, the, the fruit's there. It's growing. The promise is coming to fulfillment. She can see it. It's no longer not seen. She is seeing it. It's the beginning stages, but she can see it. At six months, you can see there's something going on inside of there. Because she had her hope restored... Her, hope, her heart was opened to encourage hope in others. As soon as she saw Mary in a loud voice, she said, you are so blessed. God is going to do this thing. It's going to be amazing. Mary wouldn't have been showing yet, but she's speaking hope into Mary's life. You guys, if we don't have hope for ourselves, it's going to be really difficult for us to help others to have hope to be able to see hope for them and to be able to encourage and build them up and, 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 or, or even worse, we'll be envious of them and despise others because of the hope that they have. Yes, hope is so important. We have to find a way to grab hold of it. Let's keep going. Verse 46. And Mary said, by the way, this is my favorite portion of worship in Scripture. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. 
His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. As hope helps us to see the goodness, the kindness, the mercy of our Lord. It opens our eyes to how amazing he is. It helps us to get to know him and to fall in love with him more and more. But just that first part, I just want to say it this way. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Here's how I hear it. My soul sings and my spirit celebrates. My soul sings and my spirit celebrates. That's what hope does for you. Let me keep going. Verse 56. Oh my gosh, there's so many verses. Verse 56. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he's to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Okay, pause really quickly. Zechariah no longer has to hope in the promise. No longer has to do it. Why not? Because he's holding the promise. And he knows God was faithful with this part of the promise. Now I can have a hope in the remainder that he would move forward, that my son really is filled with the Holy Spirit, my baby that I'm holding in my arms. And this baby that I'm holding in my arms is going to go in the power and the spirit of Elijah. And he's going to bring parents back to their children and the disobedience to the ways of the righteous. He's going to prepare the way for the Lord. He now has that hope, solid, this joyous, confident expectation of what God promised about his son is going to come to pass because God already did what may be the harder thing. And they're holding this child in their old age. And his mouth is now loosed because at this point, who's going to talk him out of it? Before he could lose his hope when he shared the word with other people, he's not going to lose it now. Look, look at my baby. I am very old and my wife is um, advanced in age. (laughs) What God promises will come to pass. Verse 66. Oh, gosh. Lord, give me that faith and that hope that nothing can shake it. Verse 66. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? Zechariah knows exactly. For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, notice his, now the father's spirit of the Holy, filled with the Holy Spirit. Just before, when Mary came in, we were told Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And John is born filled with the Holy Spirit. Corey pointed out to me this week, wow, this is the first Holy Spirit-filled family. Oh, man. Mm. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, praise be to the Lord the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. By the way, the name Zechariah means God remembers. 
the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Hear the hope? He's just prophesying it over him. He's just stating it over him as fact. Because he knows to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in the spirit. There's a difference between being filled with the spirit and being strong in the spirit. And he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. We made it. Living hope. Here's a couple of things. Just highlighting what we went through, there's a lot of information. But let me just summarize it with these basic ideas. And this is what I want us to take with us. Um, this living hope is found in us getting to know Jesus. Not just knowing about him, but that's an important part too. You have to learn about him. You have to get to know him in order to really know him. It's all part of the process. And to know him more and more, I don't care how long you've been getting to know him, there's more to know. So much more. There's so much more to know than what you know already. And there will always be. Um, second big idea walking away from this is holding on to hope is hard sometimes. And despair oftentimes seems the easier route, but it will always lead you to destruction. Despair and doubt will rob you of the blessings that God has for you and wants to bring into your life. But how do we hold on to the hope when it seems impossible, when it hurts so bad to hold on? Well, that's kind of what we're going to be talking about all year. So be here and let's lean into that. Um, but for starters, surround yourself with what I'm going to call hope stokers. Here's a new shirt for Mike. Be a hope stoker. People who are going to stoke the fire of hope in your life. Don't surround yourself with cancers. Those are people like, oh, you can't, sir. No, you need to surround yourself with stokers. They're the ones, the cancers grow fast. They'll surround you. They'll take you out. You need hope stokers in your life. Hope stokers. Look at it, just putting your hot pockets. That's, that's what we need. And we need to be. But, but here's the thing. And here's the, the next takeaway is that when we have hope, we can stoke hope in others. You need hope because others need it. And you can't stoke it in others unless you first have it in yourself. Hope makes our soul sing and our spirit celebrate. Hope makes your soul sing and your spirit celebrate. I just love that image. And finally, this is where I'm done. The foundation of our hope is in the faithfulness of God. Amen. If he said it, he will do it. Amen. What he says will come to pass. And that is more true than any circumstance you see. If he said it, it will come to pass. His word is true. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we begin this journey of living hope, I more than anything, God, I just ask that you would help us all get to know you better in this next season. Wherever we're at in, in the spectrum, whether there are some in here who are just friends of God and trying to learn and figure some stuff out before they can really commit, Lord, I pray that you would continue to draw them in. And for those of us who love you and have given our everything for you, Lord, just would you keep wooing us and drawing on our hearts? 
just to spend a little more time with you. A little better time with you. May our prayers be like incense. And may the lifting of our hands be like the evening sacrifice. Let it be so, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. To continue the journey, you can find us online at IamAntioch.com or join us next Sunday.